Yeah. Well, then we're seen as weak, and that people will think we can't win. Well, people have already reached that conclusion by levels as it is. So, no, these are shaping operations. The major offenses. You're looking at over 100,000. Someone died, and it's advancing to the surrounding regions, and then further south, uh, Russia recently took a Yushipka and is you know, dancing with North to Shasiyar. So this starting to look like a pincer movement around all of Bakhmut city. Indeed, some people are saying that there's an operational encirclement uh, already, even though you know, there's still one road left they can live on. And in the south, it appears that Russia activated this Zaporozhye front line and moves you know, kilometers north. But uh, you know, with still hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers not yet having entered the fight. Uh, how, how are you reading this? Is, the, is this the beginning of the Russian winter offensive, or are they just uh, you know, choosing their positions before they storm? Or, what? or will there be a huge offensive? Uh, or will it continue? It's gradual grinding down the army. Uh, how do you read the situation based on your background? Look, if you look at the map and you look at the size of these operations, people call them operational. I suppose you can make that argument, but these are small scale. They're what we call shaping operations, where you are deliberately destroying the, the various lines of defense. So they're gen it's generally accepted that the Ukrainians have three lines of defense in the Donbass. Uh, the first two are largely destroyed, and the third is not very strong, and has turned out to be relatively weak, which is why I think you're seeing these sudden advances. And of course, they're running out of people. You know, and I'm sure uh, Ukrainian commanders have argued that this is the time to withdraw forces to prevent them from being destroyed, so that we can build up a viable reserve force, and we can fall back to defensible terrain. But again, this is the problem. If we fall back, is the argument in Kiev. Well, then we're seen as weak and that people will think we can't win. Well, people have already reached that conclusion at high levels as it is. So no, these are shaping operations. The major offensives, you're looking at over 100,000 combat troops down in the south that will advance north. You can look at where these shaping operations have occurred and you can make up your mind where you think these advances will come from in the south. You have another 100,000 combat troops over near Beograd uh, that are faced across from Kharkov. Those are poised to attack, and they stretch all the way down to the Oxal River. Then you have another roughly 80 to 100,000 Russian combat troops in Belarus. I'm not as confident of those numbers because it may be more, it may be less. It's hard, it's hard to see up there right now. Even the people with satellite overhead views are having difficulty with precise numbers. So we've seen an enormous quantity of equipment arrive here. All the grand, the same thing together, certainly in Belarus. And then people say, well, I hear like this, well, we can, they can execute a three from, you know, a super, super envelopment from the north of Belarus, from, uh, from the uh, east in central Ukraine, and from the south uh, in southern Ukraine. Well, I suppose you could, but I don't see that as the Russian way of war at this stage. I think that you will see something on a larger scale associated with the slow, deliberate meat grinder approach that is being applied with great success in southern Ukraine. Now, larger scale associated with the slow, deliberate meat grinder approach that is being applied with great success in southern Ukraine. Now, if, if there are large openings and vast spaces, and if you look at the map, people really need to study the maps of Ukraine. Remember, months ago we had army Tired generals coming on talking about all oh, the Ukrainians are doing such a brilliant job and just look at these pictures and all those pictures were nonsense. They were it was just game stop crap. <laughs> if you look at the uh, terrain north of South Russia, it's flat. There's some there's some undulating uh, terrain, but most of it is pretty flat. I don't know what's up there, and I'm getting the impression more and more every day that there isn't really very much there. And that is the case, you might see something uh, greater than the slow delivery crime. You see more gravity events. Unless you want to be very deliberate, they understand the impact of linking overhead intelligence surveillance, uh, assets, terrestrial and space based, to the various uh, strike systems. They use their air force very effectively as well as part of this larger strike approach. I don't see that changing very much. I don't think they're going to put ground forces at risk of being uh, suddenly attacked by weapons and troops that they have not already identified by moving too quickly. But those those slow delivery grinds will, will have an effect. Files. 
my own thinking is that we're going to see all of this happen in the East first. And when the East is largely deployed in Ukrainian resistance and cleared, that's when you will see the crossing of the Dnieper River and the Northern Offensive begin. Because one of the stated goals at the very beginning of this discussion about offensives has been to cut off Ukraine from the Polish border. That has to happen. And something is going to have to be done about the regime in Kiev. But that will be the last thing that I think is on the agenda. is the manufacturing facilities for all these weapon systems are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week in Russia. As a result, there, there will be no shortage. That's, that's wishful thinking. That's the least of your concerns or of, of their concerns. The larger issue is what we talked about before. Given what they have learned over the last several months, warfare has clearly changed. The dominant feature on the battlefield is what we call ISR strike. This integration of the overhead surveillance at every level with multiple strike systems. That becomes, if you will, a huge umbrella over the entire Ukrainian state area with multiple strike systems. That becomes, if you will, a huge umbrella over huge umbrella, huge umbrella, a huge umbrella, huge umbrella over the entire Ukrainian state area. The Russians are not going to move their forces anywhere that they are not under that umbrella. Therefore, the movements will not be uh, mad dashes to seize a bridge over the Dnieper. Th these will be, not, I don't want to say slow, but methodical, deliberate. And uh, it will be slow, but methodical, deliberate. A slow, but methodical deliberate a slow but methodical deliberate and uh, it will move under the crushing weight of these strike systems that's why this is not going to end in 30 days it's not going to end in 60 days it may be 90 or 120 simply because they are being methodical and they will destroy all of the Ukrainian resistance but it just won't look like a World War II blitzkrieg. I keep hearing people talk about blitzkrieg. That was a different era, and uh, that kind of capability exists. But it's not something that you do in this era where you have ISR strike arrayed against you. And even though the Ukrainian capabilities are much degraded and denuded of what they had earlier, it's still a danger. And the Russians have made it very clear. The commanding generals have made it clear. They're not interested in sacrificing Russian lives unnecessarily. So they'll be methodical and they'll be deliberate as opposed to on the fly uh, or battlefield opportunists in the, in the old German sense of the word. But I see the, the, the eastern side taking president, uh, presidents first over the west. That doesn't mean they won't go west. I think they'll have to. And every day that we open our mouths, and characterize the Russians in the very negative way that we do and make these outrageous demands of them and keep talking about regime destruction and dismemberment of Russia as the long-term goal, the more likely it becomes that the Russians will have to move all the way to the Polish and Romanian and Moldovan borders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I want to ask about, because uh, have there really been negotiations anymore? Because uh, I, I have to look at uh, Moscow's perspective. Uh, you know, from that perspective, uh, NATO countries, you know, sabotage the previous Minsk II agreement for seven years. And then again, uh, when Russia invaded, it was a settlement to use in the UK Minsk to you know, again, abandon negotiations. So there's quite little trust in Moscow at the moment. And also... The fear obviously would be that if there would be a peace, the West would merely do as it would 
A last agreement in play. You said it's an opportunity to arm the Ukraine to the teeth again.